So I had the guys from God Awful Movies on a few months back. By the way, the repercussions from that show, guys, continues even today. Uh, <laughs> International Gorillas is probably a hallmark moment in the history of this show, the 300-plus <laughs> now episode history of this show. International Gorillas is probably one of the highlights of the entire run of the last six years, and it's thanks to you guys. So hats off <laughs> to you. Apologize. <laughs> A we know that I... that never really recovered. You never really get over watching three people dressed like Batman for no reason. Three <laughs> hours of it, too. By the way, if you haven't seen our god-awful movie show in archive, I'll link it in the description box. But, you know, I sort of kind of hated to add my name to the hat of all the podcasters and the activists and the comedians who were going to review Ray Comfort's new film, but it was just too good to target an opportunity. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's out there. It's begging you. <laughs> To review yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Being Watching Ray's movies is like eating McDonald's. You know it's not going to be good, but you and you pass by and you everyone's told you it's not going to be good. And you you deep down and you say to yourself, I don't need it. And then you're just like fish sandwiches. And afterwards you're like, oh, what happened? The fish yeah. wasn't better. The fish <laughs> wasn't better. And you could buy it for a dollar. There's a lot of, <laughs> There's a lot of so it's Ray Comfort's hit the reason rally recently. He does what Ray Comfort does. He finds an event that somebody else pays for. And he hangs out <laughs> in the periphery with a table and a banner, right? So he didn't have to reserve a spot at the Lincoln Memorial. And he didn't have to advertise for a national event. He didn't have to do any of that stuff. No, he just let everybody else do it. And then he went and put a table up. And he had people walking around advertising his film. Eli goes up. And has an introduction to the man himself. Please tell me what happened. So it, it has been alleged that this story is true. And I want to say that I can't imagine any of this happening. So I text Noah and I'm like, Ray's here. Ray's here. I'm going to lick him. And I've been making jokes the entire week leading up to it. Like, I'm going to lick Ray Comfort because I'm stronger than him. And he can't stop me. <laughs> so I text Noah and Noah is like, don't do it yet. Don't wait for me to get there. Wait for me to get there. But I see my opportunity. I go in and I get him in like a close forearm handshake, like one of these really clasp it in there. And I'm like, Hey man, I really love your work. Can I get a picture? And my wife knows I'm like, honey, you know, like there might be an arrest after this. So I'm going to need you to get this picture. And it's perfect. She gets me right before I stick out my tongue. Like, huh? And she gets me right in the moment before I lick him. And he and he makes a little Australian noise. He goes like, yeah, give it, give it. And I go, oh, yeah, man. Sorry, I'm sweaty. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sweaty. And he looks at me and I know he knows in that moment. I know he's like. This Jew just licked me, but he has to live in the world where I licked him if he admits it. So he's just like, right, have a good one. Nice meeting you. <laughs> I yeah. appreciate that we can both pretend that didn't happen. Eli's joking. He's going off Andrew's script okay. and he's yeah. not doing it correctly. He's improvising. <laughs> it's that such was, a so it's violation. Like, oh, I, I think of that and I think, what would I do? I have no idea what I would do. Eli, you're not coming. I'm getting a restraining order. You come anywhere near me, Eli. <laughs> from this I've got moment. a mustache and glasses on next time I see that. <laughs> well, hello there. Now, the God Awful <laughs> Movies, guys. close to your face. You have a history with Ray's films, right? You have a cherished, beloved piece of your heart that belongs to Ray Comfort, correct? Give me some history on some of the films you've reviewed. Oh. Well, this is actually the first one of Ray's that we've done on God Awful Movies. But before this lived as its own show, when it was still a segment on Scathing Atheist, we did his wonderful film, Audacity, also known as Ray the Gay Away. Oh, uh, yeah. Murdering the Lesbians in the Elevators, the movie. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Wait, 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 wait. I need context, Heath. What did you just <laughs> did say? Did I not give enough context there? <laughs> Uh, killing lesbians in an elevator, the movie. That was kind of the theme there. With, <laughs> that, that's what you would be doing if you didn't stop <laughs> lesbians from being lesbians by being a giant hate speechy <laughs> asshole. It's basically like letting them into a broken elevator that you know about. Same thing. Yes, that is the movie. That, that's his other movie that we did. That's a literal metaphor that happens in the movie. The main character has a dream. For those of you who are confused, the main character has a dream that he's like in an elevator with two lesbians and he's super Christian. And he's like, it's fine. I guess I'll just let them be lesbians. And then the elevator, and literally he turns around and he's like, Nuh! they fall to their deaths because that is the equivalent of letting people be gay. <laughs> <to Ray Comfort. laughs> 
Ray's got a thing about death. We're going to come to that in just a few, <laughs> right? Because we're talking about the atheist delusion, the film, which just released. You can watch the whole thing for free on YouTube. Yes, I'll include the link. And I can't imagine. How long did, did you guys last for the entire film? Did you have to watch it in sections? <laughs> well, I'm getting older. I'm past 40 now, Seth. It never, it never really goes all the way for me uh, anymore. Uh -huh. But... Uh, no, but you know what? Like we've done international gorillas, right? We've sat through three-hour Bollywood musicals about whatever the hell that thing was about. So killing Salman with, Rushdie. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> with with a lightning bolt Quran, exactly. But the, but the beauty of it is, is that after doing stuff like that, after watching these just behemoth two-hour Mormon musicals and whatnot, really, there's nothing Ray can throw at me in an hour that's going to bother me all that much. Right yeah, this from was the, the opening credits. Watch. Right from the opening credits, my first thought is, how long till somebody cries? Because <laughs> you know he's he's cherry-picked some, some people who probably are completely clueless about if they're atheists, if they're legitimately atheists. And that's a good question. You know, do they really understand what an atheist is? Because I was curious. Oh, it's yeah, phenomenal. I, I think it's important to point out that, like, you know, I'm not going to call the people in this movie stupid. I'm sure some of them are really smart. Some of them are obviously in the midst of drug benders and stuff. But the man on the street <laughs> interviews that Ray was doing, like if, if if we went out right now and asked 100 Christians, who is the president, who is the first president of the United States? One of them would say Billy Ray Cyrus. We'd have at least one person like Jay Leno made a whole thing of doing this and going out and finding the dumbest people he possibly could. So we know that the worst possible way that you can get like good answers to questions is to just go ask the person with the green hair. No offense to the person with the green hair, but he's clearly going out of his way saying, who doesn't look educated here? Who wants a slice mm. of pizza here? <laughs> right. This is the theological version of Homo says what? That's Ray's entire career. <laughs> he's like, what? Ha <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, yeah, make a meal. <laughs> it is rare that I have seen people so not self-aware. On camera, it's whenever they were asked, oh, are you an atheist? They're absolutely sure I'm an atheist. And then mm -hmm. why are you an atheist? How did you come to a point of non-belief? What does atheism even mean? How is it defined? How does your non-belief in the supernatural inform your life? What's your criteria for truth? I'm waiting for all of this stuff. And they just glaze over. They have no <laughs> idea why they're atheists. I, I thought you were just going to get mad like my stepdad. Can you just get mad? <laughs> Let's start with the opening credits. I'll start with you, Eli. Set up the atheist illusion. Okay, so we start out with like DNA and the planet flying around in front of us. Very clearly, we're supposed to believe that this movie is the setup to like a movie about a virus that kills everyone except Brad Pitt. <laughs> like that's what we're supposed to see. <laughs> but instead, we get a monologue of Ray being upset that we're just humans on Earth. Now. Now, the point I think he's making in this moment is like, we're not, we're meant, we're souls and we live forever. But when you come at this realistically, the first part of this movie is just him going, you know what we're not? We're not angels floating through maple syrup. We're not fish floating through gelatin. And that's down. Welcome to my movie. It's going to get worse from here. <laughs> And they're showing these evil shots with like scary music in the background, literally at one point of a DNA strand, like a graphic of that, and then a finch. And then like, <laughs> these are the bad guys, this beak and this strand of GATC. Those are the bad guys in this movie. <laughs> Noah, you want to chime in? Well, I, I just, I love that there's this very clear effort to say right away, look, there's animals. That makes this a documentary. Right, because all this movie really is is Ray ambushing people on the street that don't realize that conversations with strangers should have safe words. But what? It, it, but he intersperses this with all of this just generic animal footage that very rarely has anything to do with what he's talking about, as if to say, no, look, it's just like the Discovery Channel. We put in birds flying in slow motion and stuff. Yeah, well, this is what's so amazing about Ray is that a ton of his movies are generated for people who will get bored if there isn't an, a montage of animals cuddling to French music. <laughs> all the way like half of Ray's listeners would be like, I don't get it. What's going on? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Fluffy bunnies cuddling. You've won me back. Comfort. 
First 90 seconds. Yo. There's a kind of a dark night knockoff for the soundtrack, right? Very intense. It's very Michael Bay, sort of a very Hans Zimmer. We see the solar system. We see there's a medical scan. It's totally out of context. It's just a, some scan <laughs> that's not really scanning anything. There's a surfer. There's an F1 racer. And the whole time I'm thinking the subtitle of the film should be, I have an iStock photo account. Because that's what the film was. Right, right. Like you could play a game with these, like trying to figure out what was the connective thread in his montage. It's like uh, green things that have been around since before 1950. Like there was, it was just like literally, it's like, and now nouns with some verbs. And in the montage, one of the cutaways is to this very desperate, sad looking old man who declares he would like to kill himself. I mean, just right off the bat. For, for no out context. of context, no con yeah. it's just, do you want to kill yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to kill myself. And it's, like, it's because you saw this movie? Yup, that's what it is. <laughs> case, I get it. If that's the full conversation, if the guy was like, I saw the future and I saw your movie and I'd like to go into the darkness, I'm like, I get it, Ronald McConnell. <laughs> We have to start with, uh, I mean, Ray Stick is always back to Adam, Eve, the Bible. Adam, Genesis, the Bible. He, Adam, I don't know how many times he referenced Adam or Adam and Eve in the film. Do you guys think he really, I mean, I, I know this is a subjective <laughs> question. I mean, do you think he really believes the Bible or you think this is just his shtick? I mean, he's like, an, he's on autopilot. He's been doing the same stuff over and over. Is he that bought in or you think he's selling something? Well, that, that's the real key, right? Because everything he does is just a Russian nesting doll of buying his other stuff, right? During the course of this movie, we're going to advertise his book. We're going to like tell you how you can buy more copies of this video to give away. You can buy the course that teaches you how to bother atheists and hold a microphone really close to their nose until they tell you that they'll agree with you about Jesus if you leave them alone. Like Everything that he does just seems in furtherance of a different thing he does for money. You know, t take that for whatever it's worth. I'm waiting for the I, revel. I'm waiting for the argument I haven't heard yet. And at the beginning, he hands the subject a book. Somebody want to describe this for the audience? What was his big selling point? <laughs> this is so. So he hands them. We're going to find out his book again. Russian. <laughs> he can't even take a book that he didn't write. He doesn't own a book that's not his. And he goes, "You like that book? It's really fantastic. Got color pictures and letters and that." And they're all like, "Yeah, it's a book, Ray. Okay, what do you want?" And he goes, "Now, is it possible for that book?" for the ink to just fall out of the sky magically and form randomly out of nothingness. And you can see two of the people, because again, most of these are stone teenagers who we won't give their hacky sack back until they're done with the interview. <laughs> but but so you can see a few of them be like, no, it's not possible for the book to form by itself. And the rest are like, Raw! all right, dude, you couldn't make a book out of nowhere. <laughs> He immediately jumps from that with with no irony. He immediately jumps from that to, you know, they say DNA is the book of life. So if books can't come out of nowhere, then, eh? Well, and, and what, what this means is that he <laughs> he thinks that our postulation is that, like, just the G's, the A's, the T's, and the C's were just falling from the sky. Like, even if you set aside the fact that we went from metaphor to literal with no transition in between, <laughs> even then it breaks down. He's not pitching at that moment a specific God. This is a weird deistic designer. This is just some other, some watchmaker, right? He's... Not actually selling at that moment. The words coming out of his mouth don't sell the Christian God in any way. And Comfort seems completely unaware of that fact. Yeah, he uh, points out that there's 3.2 billion letters in our D. And so, like, we if we were a book, there'd be 3.2 billion letters. How many letters would there be in the DNA of a warlock that created the universe? <laughs> and he's saying, what is more, are you serious? <laughs> He's insane. Well, that's yeah. the thing, too, is that even, again, even if you grant that his argument works in the multiple ways that it doesn't, all he's done is to, is, is thrown out this first mover thing with the, well, but, you know, ours is the bottom turtle, though. Ours, our guy is the bottom turtle, so there doesn't have to be anything for him to be standing upon. <laughs> yeah, because his example is it's silly to believe a book would appear from nowhere, but it's not silly to believe a book, a magic, sentient, hateful <laughs> book that wants you to have sex with only certain people, that's always <laughs> been around. There's always been a book just watching you. 
<laughs> That's totally fine. Ray's name comes up quite a bit in conversations. However, it often doesn't come up with any background or backstory. We call him the banana man, and we're going to get to that. <laughs> He's tied to Kirk Cameron. We're going to get to that. But let me just give some of our viewers and listeners a real fast backstory. Ray Comfort, born in New Zealand back in 1949. He went to high school. I don't think he did any college, but he graduated from Christ Church High School. He ended up in Southern California in the late 80s on the pastoral staff at a non-denominational Christian church called Calvary Chapel. And he teamed up with Kirk Cameron, I think this was mid to late 1990s, to start an organization and kind of a an evangelical enterprise called The Way of the Master. And of course, Mr. Deity is riffed on that with The Way of the Mister, which is a, a great parody. But the whole purpose, of course, was to go out and evangelize and preach the gospel message. He's a full-time evangelist. I think he does this 100% of the time. Uh, he's written several books, including 1989's Hell's Best Kept Secret, 1993, God <laughs> Doesn't Believe in Atheists, 2008's Evolution, A Fairy Tale for Grown-Ups, and 2009's You Can Lead an Atheist to Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think. And of course, he's most famous for a video clip that I think originated around the early 2000s with Kirk Cameron, where he picked up a banana... He held it to the, the camera lens and said, this is the atheist nightmare. Would anyone like to tell this story? <laughs> I would love to, but I just want to point out to any up-and-coming evangelicals that might, might be listening in that when you introduce a phallic object into the video that you're then going to pass on to atheists, it's probably better if you then don't talk about how great it fits into your mouth and how perfect it is for your hand. Okay, so Ray Comfort, not realizing that the modern day banana is ge a genetically modified version of an inedible fruit that uh, you know occurred naturally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Monsanto. Uh, thank you. Po postulates that the only explanation for the banana being so perfect for human consumption is the fact that God exists. I mean, it even has a tab with which to peel it. If you peel your bananas backwards. <laughs> that's not how you should do no. it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so he puts out this video and of course, everyone had a blast with it for a number of reasons, not the least of which was Kurt Cameron just sitting next to him the whole time, just kind of nodding along like this makes so much sense. I bet you guys didn't think of that. Now, to, to Ray's credit, he did eventually rescind the banana argument when it was pointed out to him that, no, that actually is proof of evolution <laughs> more so than uh, God creating bananas preformed. And actually, if your postulation is that if God exists, there would be things like bananas that naturally formed, you've actually created evidence against your claim. He did back off of that particular claim. And as near as I can tell, that's the last thing Ray learned a new fact. <laughs> right. well, well, I've made a, a list of bullets from that video. The banana perfectly shaped to fit the human hand, the banana made for us. It has a protective non-slip surface to hold. It's also biodegradable and <laughs> sits gracefully over the human hand. There it is again. Yes. It's curved toward the face for ease of <laughs> consumption and does not <laughs> squirt in one's face. There's a pull tab at the top for easy access, and it's color-coded, so you'll know how ripe it is. Green, yellow, black. These tell you whether or not you have a good banana. I remember the meme that floated around on the internet right after this video became famous that said that the banana fits perfectly in your hand that also fits perfectly in your ass. And I thought that was pretty, pretty good. So. Here's what I think is so amazing about Ray that that no other apologist before him really did, which is Ray created the sensation of Christians vague booking about atheists. Because here's the, I think the before Ray, you sort of had the guy who stood up at front and he was like, oh, Satan's going to get you. Satan's going to get you. And Ray was the first to be like, you see this crazy? I'm doubling down. You see me? <laughs> I'm doubling down. I'm not ignoring the atheists. I'm coming after you. And since then, he's just been like, yeah, come on, take me on. All right, come on, take me on. I'm the fresh <laughs> He's lost 
At this point, he has lost dozens of debates and been disproven every time. And he doesn't even go la la la. He's like, I don't need to put my fingers in my ears because I've already got these bananas in there. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you brought the debates up. He debated at the American Atheist National Convention, I think back in 2001. Uh, He's done some other debates since. He was featured in 2014 on a Christian radio show or radio podcast uh, with Matt Dillahunty. And after it was over, Matt Dillahunty was so frustrated, he said, I'll never debate the guy again. I was curious to get the story from the horse's mouth. I'm going to break away for just a second and play you a short conversation I had about Ray Comfort with Matt Dillahunty. Check it out. Matt, it was a couple of years ago. You're on the radio, Christian radio show, talking to Ray Comfort. But yes. paint the picture for me real fast. The encounter with Ray on that show was like what? It was it was painful, and a lot of people felt that it was a waste of my time. But I didn't I didn't feel that way at all. Uh, they had invited me on specifically to debate. I'd been on the radio program once before, and they said, "Hey, we'd love to have you on so that you can debate Ray Comfort." And I'm like, "Okay, sure," because I'll you know, almost debate almost anyone, almost any time. And Ray came on and basically said, oh, I don't really have any interest in demonstrating that God existed. I was, I was here presenting arguments and Ray said, yeah, I don't really care to present arguments. I just love Matt and I don't want him to go to hell. And so I had spent all this time presenting my case. We had back and forth. I pointed out problems with his Uh, arguments to the extent that he tried to present any argument, which was not very clear. And the whole thing, I can understand why people felt that it was a waste of time. I didn't feel it was a waste of time because I was on drive time Christian radio presenting the case for non-belief in the Christian God, the case for atheism, and their representative didn't even make an attempt and flat out said, you know, hey, I don't really care that much to demonstrate that a God exists. I just love Matt and I don't want him to go now, to hell. Is it true that you said that you'd never debate him personally again, that you were done wasting your time? Yes. So far, there's only a couple people that I won't debate again, but Ray is definitely one of them. And it, and it's not because I dislike him. And as a matter of fact, I just got finished an email exchange with him about the Atheist Delusion movie that he just released. But if I'm going to be doing debates, I want opponents who actually are respectful of the debate process and who care about the conversation and who are there uh, to try to defend their beliefs and to have the conversation with me. Uh, As a matter of fact, I don't even really need a structured, formal debate where you've got, you know, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Just being able to have a conversation would be awesome. But if my opponent's going to show up and say, "Ah, I know I was invited here to debate, but I don't really care to. I just want to witness and share the gospel I'm not interested in that. You can do that on your own time in whatever video you feel like producing next week that says the same thing you've said a hundred times before. I'm shouting at the screen as I'm listening. I've got it pulled up in a browser when he's telling you that you weren't a true Christian. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, what a hugely presumptuous thing to say. It's really interesting. And and years ago, I did a video on this, whether or not I am a true Christian. And it depends entirely by what you mean. If you mean... Uh, someone who actually has a relationship with the risen Savior, then no, I was never a Christian because I don't think there's any risen Savior for anyone to have an actual relationship with. But under that definition, I don't think anybody is a, a true Christian. But if you mean that you are someone who is convinced that you have that relationship, that you uh, are a Bible-believing, uh, washed-in-the-blood Christian, and, and you are convinced this is the, this is the case, and you are uh, engaged in witnessing to others based. Then I was definitely Christian. Everybody who went to my church, you know, hey, they were all convinced God wanted me to be a preacher, including my parents. I, you know, it's this, you were no true true Christian is rather convenient. And uh, and I'd also caution atheists to you know, not respond in a similar way when somebody says, oh, I was an atheist and now I'm a Christian. I've heard atheists say, oh, well, you weren't really an atheist. And the correct response in my view is, well, okay, maybe you were an atheist, but please explain why you were an atheist and what changed your mind. Because being an atheist doesn't mean you were an atheist for good reasons, and it doesn't mean you changed your mind for good reasons. Before I redirect back to the, the god-awful movies, guys, Reviewing the film, The Atheist Illusion, have you seen it? Did you last through the entire film? And what are your thoughts? I did not. 
I did not last through the entire film. I made it through the first 20 minutes or so, and I immediately emailed Ray, uh, basically saying that I was disappointed because this felt incredibly dishonest. The marketing for it was, oh, we're going to release this, and it's the one scientific question. Well, first of all, it wasn't one question. It wasn't even one argument. It was this mishmash of the same stuff that he's been saying forever. Only in this case, he had uh, a video of him interviewing Lawrence Krauss, giving him an explanation uh, that I thought was – pretty well done, and then completely abused. Oh, the complexity of DNA, it's just too much. Um, this is the arrogance of and confusion about science that, hey, we should have an explanation for this by now. And the fact that science can't give you an explanation means that my ancient explanation from my preferred holy book is right. Well, that's just not true. Your, your, your preferred explanation doesn't become right or justifiable until you present the evidence for it. You can't merely say, hey, science can't explain this, therefore God wins. Any other thoughts about the uh, Comfort movie before I pinball back to the review? I was actually interested as he's running around doing his man on the street interviews. He grabs uh, a bunch of atheists and they probably are. And he asks them these questions. And it's clear that he's talking to people who haven't actually considered these topics who are not experts in this area. And yet he has an interview where he's sitting down with Lawrence Krauss. And it seems to me that all he showed was Lawrence Krauss's answer about a snowflake. Why didn't he ask Lawrence these questions and then show those responses? Why didn't he ask me these questions and show those responses? Why didn't he ask you these questions? Why didn't he ask anybody who does this sort of thing regularly and who engages on this instead of going out and finding wishy-washy, rather uninformed people on the street who identify as atheist. Do you, does he even realize how horrible I could make Christians look by doing, running around going and doing man on the street interviews, asking Christians to defend their faith? What's worse is I could make them look just as bad by talking to him. Do you guys hear any of that show with Dillahunty and Ray Comfort? Yeah, I've heard the whole thing, which is amazing because, look, I love Matt. I really do. And Matt really came in ready for a conversation. And Ray really came in trying to do the it's not your fault scene from Goodwill Hunting. They, they, <laughs> they had, and you can see Matt. Re there's a moment. If you listen to it, you can hear Matt realize that about halfway through. the Like the 18th time Ray is like, now, nah, deep down in your heart, you know that Christ loves you and you know that Christ. He does it like the 18th time. And you hear Matt just be like. I don't want to go. I don't want to. Don't want to I don't want to do this anymore. This is not worth my time. I'm gonna go do sit-ups. Like you can hear him want to do anything, but this you hear him shuffling cards in the background, <laughs> <laughs> a police magic trick, and it's like I get it. You hear the despair we've all had with our Trump supporting uncle. <laughs> Just like yeah, you're right. I mean, they all do smell different. Sure, why not? Pass the potatoes. Anything. Well, it turns out that Ray Comfort makes films like he debates. He has a couple of talking points, vacuous talking points, and he just hammers them over and over and over. When I was watching The Atheist Delusion, and I had to watch it in pieces, in sections, just to keep from going crazy, I came away thinking, this man is obsessed with death. And I read a great story about a mass mailer that apparently originated from his ministry back in 2010, October of 2010. Elderly people received cards, appointment cards from Ray's ministry. On the cards, they were asked to jot down the date and time of their own death. Now, these are old people who were probably pretty close to that day anyway. The gist was he wanted them to be thinking about their own mortality and on the card, it encouraged them to seek out an evangelist so that they might accept Jesus. Living Waters Ministry, Waters. I guess uh, they apologized or explained, that ah, we don't really know. We're just trying to draw a circle around our own mortality and Jesus' love and all that stuff. It's just a great story that, again, focuses on death. See, now, when I send people a card telling them when they're going to die, people call the cops. I'm not allowed to go to Reason Con anymore. You're not allowed to get within 500 feet of Cara Santa Maria. It's a whole thing. Does it? Offers a simple apology. I just want to say it's unfair. It's biased. I just want to say it's biased. Well, I love the confluence of paranoia and insanity here because, I'm sorry, you said this happened in, in 2010, correct? I believe that's the report. It was 2010 in the Herald. 
Okay, so this is after the death panels trope was already out there, and there was somebody scheduling the deaths of old people through the mail. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think he thought of that or was doing that intentionally, but yeah, I'd be a little freaked out. I could see my wife's grandma getting a little freaked out about that. The image of Ray doing an Obama impersonation on the phone. Hello, it's me, Barack Obama. And I'm just here to schedule your death. I'm Blake. I guess he's like Jack Chick. He's handed out, or his ministry's handed out millions upon, or allegedly millions of tracks or booklets. Did you guys follow it all? The death of Jack Chick recently? You know, the legend passed away at the age of 92. A tremendous loss. I don't normally do soft shoe, uh, but yeah, I, I made a, I made an exception. In the case, look, I don't want to celebrate anyone's death, but if I did, it would be Jack Chick. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It would be Phyllis Schlafly first, and then Jack Chick. I'm just, I'm digging a hole here, Seth. <laughs> Anthony and Scalia first, and then <laughs> the two you said. Yeah. Not anymore. Not Who was anymore. it? Did they say something like, you can't celebrate? I mean, it's not necessarily good taste to celebrate someone's demise, but you can sort of be relieved, you know, like it's over, like they personally can't do any more damage. Well, and it's good radio either way. Jack yeah. Chick <laughs> did a lot of damage. Now, I don't know how if anybody was genuinely convinced by the Chick track, but I do remember when I was a kid. And a lot of these have very adult themes in them. And there's always hellfire. There's always damnation. You know, uh, someone so played D&D &D, and look, now they're swinging in their bedroom from a noose. This was during the height of the satanic panic. It really kind of, it, it certainly planted the seeds of fear in the minds and in the hearts of a whole lot of people, especially kids. And, yeah, because yeah. I think you and I kind of grew up in the same time. I don't know, like, if, if you ever got, I mean, I got these in my, like, trick-or-treat basket. I got uh, the, the the chick tracks and, and various others, but specifically those ones. And they always, like you said, they always end with the hell and the damnation. And virtually all of them, the last panel is someone burning in hell. And I know as a kid who's eight years old, whose parents are just kind of vaguely like, yeah, yeah, there's a Jesus. And you go to heaven or something, ask me later after a drink. Um, you know, that I, I can tell that, like, at least at that time, I was terrified if the infrastructure had been there to, like, work on that terror and turn it into religious belief the way it's supposed to work. I would say absolutely we can blame him for some of the damage done. Back to the atheist delusion in the film, Ray Comfort wants to talk to people about the fact that they're going to die. He is the tapping on the shoulder of the Reaper to the interviewees on camera. You know, one day you're going to die. You know that day is coming. You know you're going to die. You know you're mortal. Death comes to us all. You know you're going to die. Well, I kept thinking that was going to turn into an argument. He kept saying, you know, 54 million people die every year, whatever it is. And and it's just like, okay, where are we going with that? Like, nowhere. Just, just throwing that out there. You could be one of them. I wish I could do the Ray Comfort accent like you guys. I, I've got one accent in it. You know, it, it sounds like Buck Owens from Hee Haw. I, I can't do any, any real. I, so. The key is it's it's Baba voice. So they'll do Baba voice. And then you just give it an Australian accent. Yeah. So, do, so it's like, Ammo, you're going to do Ammo. But then you you squish it down. And then you take the pain of that one time that you and Kirk Cameron kissed on the mouth on that plane ride. And you just really internalize it. And you come out as right Comfort. Give it, a, give it, a, give, it a, give it, give it, give it, So he's trying to scare the shit out of people who have obviously never heard of things like the argument from complexity, the argument for design, the argument from ignorance, the God of the gaps. They're totally ignorant of the God of the gaps. Oh, oh my, there are gaps in our knowledge? Yeah. <laughs> really? They didn't even know the argument from you are, which is a really good one <laughs> that he throws out there. I thought that was pretty effective. Accident, I accident, chance, chance, accident, accident, chance. Chance, would someone please explain to Ray Comfort how evolution actually works? Because the way he has it laid out, everything was sort of evolving with us in mind, right? We were the end result, or we were the what everything was evolving to serve. How did this happen? It's a complete mis misrepresentation of what evolution is, and it's maddening to watch on camera. Well, what's amazing is in this movie, and I don't know why, maybe Ray lost a bet, he has Lawrence Krauss who just hip tosses him 
onto the floor and he poops himself and he kept it in the movie. <laughs> he spends the entire first half of the movie being like, hey, DNA is so complex. There's no way it could form on its own. And then he cuts. He's like, hey, I talked to Lawrence Krauss. And Lawrence Krauss is like, yeah, but a snowflake like works based on polarity. We all agree a snowflake doesn't get created. And yet it's incredibly complex. And Ray's answer is, now that might seem like a great argument, but montage of bunnies cuddling. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't leave that. Right. I know you watch everything about it, buddy. You don't leave the losses in. All right. I never have an intro to all of my shows with what my exes think of me. And you should show <laughs> clips of when you talk to grownups. Stick with the stone teenagers. Just give them their Frisbee back when you're done and you're all good. You got but a model he, that works. But he did keep it, which means <laughs> after that argument, he was like, I just shot myself and I nailed it. We're keeping that. And he take it out. When he handed Lauren, especially if you know Lawrence Krauss, who has no patience for bullshit, right, at all. When he hands him the book and does the book argument, <laughs> the, the ink falling from the cosmos argument. I'm sitting in the background at that point going, Ray, don't do it. No, don't do it, Ray. This works with the kid with the green hair. Menthol Ronald McDonald bought this one. That doesn't mean <laughs> Lawrence Krauss is no man. If I can cut away again for just a second, I wanted to take a second and ask Lawrence about how the hell he ended up on camera with Ray Comfort and what his impression was of that exchange. And here's that clip. Lawrence Krauss, the snowflake proves a designer. Let's just start there. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 we, you know, we have this we have this hardwired instinct to need to, for things to be made by someone or something with a purpose. And the great thing about a snowflake is it depends upon the polar fact that water is a polar molecule with these with uh, with these sort of 57 degree angles and and it can make beautiful crystals as can many many substances make beautiful crystals we have the the illusion of design is very powerful uh, the example a snowflake is a great example uh, and it and, and and you know when when people like Ray Comfort ask can a book make itself or can a snowflake make itself the answer is you know the laws of physics make these things and it just happens and People are very disappointed that things just happen, but uh, it's an amazing feature of the world. And there's organization at all levels uh, that is quite complex in the universe from the way a star works to the way a snowflake works. The other example I can think of for the illusion of design beyond a snowflake, which as I say, unless you think someone's coming in to make every single beautiful snowflake, the, the wonderful thing is you give me the equations of electrodynamics and the chemical properties of hydrogen and oxygen, and boom, a snowflake happens. Just like the beautiful ice crystals on a window happen, and they're different, and they're beautiful, and they're random and lovely. And I suppose, as I've said in my, actually in my new book, that if you lived on one of the ice crystals on a window, then uh, you view them at random angles. They're gorgeous, but if you lived on one, you, you'd see the, the laws of physics along one along the spine of the crystal be very different than along the little filaments. And uh, if you're a physicist, you might try and understand that. But you might also say that that one direction that's chosen is chosen by God. And, 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 um, and, the, and your universe is designed, so that direction is special. But then you wouldn't know that there are lots of other ice crystals pointing in other directions. We get, to, we get the, the, the benefit of seeing that by being outside the ice crystal. So you have to be really worrisome when you take a property of the universe that just happens and assume it's designed. As I say, the other good example I can think of is, is um, uh, our geodesic domes, the kind that Buckminster Fuller made. You look at them and you say, clearly that's human intelligence in designing those things. But then you have Buckminster Fullerene, carbon-60, which is a perfect geodesic dome uh, cr created by carbon molecules, and it comes from soot. <laughs> you burn, car you, you just have soot and you find it there, and it's a remarkable material that, um, that may be very useful from superconductors to new tensile strength materials. But it comes from just soot, the most disorganized thing you can imagine. So ascribing design is a very dangerous thing to do. And, uh, and people who do it, do it because they want to do it. But in fact, because they make them feel better. But the universe doesn't exist to make us feel better. Well, you use the word organization. I can see how people can jump to agency, right? I mean, if it's organized, there must be an organizer. I mean, that's a leap that Ray Comfort made, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think the the the, uh, the idea that that there there's self organization in the world is is in some sense um, 
discomforting to us. But organization exists on all levels. What it requires is the input of energy. And, you know, people often say, oh, the laws of the second law of thermodynamics is violated because, you know, things are more, getting more complex. Life makes things more complex. The point is, if you input energy into a system, you can make it more complex. You can make it organized. It, the, the, a system that's closed will lead eventually to, to, uh, to be more disorganized. But if you continually pump in energy, then, then, uh, then, then you can produce uh, beautiful structures, and nature does. And uh, as I say, the, the, from the, from the, the sun is a great example. It's this, it's this incredibly disorganized structure in one sense. It's 100 billion hydrogen bombs going off every second in it, but it's perfectly round, and, and, and it, it persists in that way for billions of years. Uh, if you want to see what a what a system behaves like when you don't pump in energy into it, look at what a what a what a cadaver looks like after a long time, and you'll see that that, that doesn't uh, seem so so organized. We just saw a couple of minutes with Ray Comfort in the film. How long did you guys actually speak? We we spoke for uh, probably uh, well uh, the the filming probably was good twenty to thirty minutes. Um, we talked about a lot of things. We made fun of bananas. Um, for example, and um, and there is a there is a video that you, where you can see m m uh, the entire discussion because it was actually we had it videoed by people who videoed the people who videoed because I wasn't <laughs> worried that they would 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 take me out of context. But to be to, but to be fair to him, he he obviously caught what I did, but he did let me know about it. He said we can't. This is a full length feature film. We really can't use more than a little over two minutes. So I'd like to show you what we're going to use. And we went back and forth. I would have liked some things to be there. But, you know, that I understand filmmaking. And he wasn't so – he wasn't uh, disingenuous about, about what he did. And I want to give him credit for that. He did run by me the edits he wanted to make. Uh, and, and so uh, the, 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 what I tried to get across, which, which, uh, which I, don't, I don't remember was in the film, is that some of these questions are just simply silly questions. Because, you know, can a book write itself is a silly question because it implies the book has some internal existence beyond the materials from which it's made. And and um, as I say, it's hard to for people to imagine symbol systems self-assembling. But, you know, if you really want to see how easy it is, take sand and pebbles and rocks of different different sizes and, and, and put them in a jar and shake them and see what happens. The system will self-organize. So all you have to do is have that kind of energy. You didn't have to assign each pebble in its place, and you'll see it. And uh, it's a wonderful, beautiful aspect of nature. And trying to understand that is really, in some sense, one of the forefront of physics areas, is trying to understand how these, these complex structures can arise naturally. So instead of it's, – it's as often as the case, it, it's the lazy man's route. You can either say, I can try and understand how this happens, or God did it. And one is easy, and the other is hard. Ray Comfort's got a thing for Dawkins, right? Uh, Dawkins thinks nothing created everything. And he shamelessly quote mines a Dawkins TV interview. It's a debate between him and Cardinal George <laughs> Pell. Yep. The guy who covered up all the child rape? That's who Ray decides to show on his side. He's like, you know who really <laughs> stopped it to him? The child rape covering up and alleged child rapist George Powell. He's on my side. Welcome to the side of reason. <laughs> He's trying to do a quote mine of this debate. Again, George Powell is enough. He's trying to do a quote mine of the debate, but his editor messed up so badly that we have 78 seconds of Richard talking with nothing coming out of his face to get the Who's quote of him being like, and that's why everything came from nothing. And Ray's like, see, see, all those words, right in order, bam. <laughs> Ray Comfort ties a biogenesis into evolution. Those are two different things, <laughs> right? And then it's another montage: complexity, diversity, the dog, the horse, the tree, the wildflower, the surfer. There's the F1 racer again. There's a whole montage of these things. Some right? cool clips, yeah. It, the point is what in the beginning there was something and that's all he's got I, like something created the universe and that's all he's got yeah, this is like going to a botanist and being like oh so you claim to know how flowers grow why doesn't my mother love me and it's like no Ray, those, are, <laughs> those are both questions and i see how flowers and love 
but you need to work this out for you. And he's like, uh, I get it. You can't answer the question. Ray comes <laughs> They say time flies. Well, this clock will make me disappear. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the atheist delusion is when Ray Comfort asks his charges on camera, his interviewees, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Like this is, you know, it's a fun question <laughs> at parties, right? But is this really how we talk about, about evolution? You know, what came first, chicken blood or vessels <laughs> or, or a chicken heart? Which came first? <laughs> Well, I, I want to point out, first of all, that he managed to find a series of people who had clearly not heard this question before. <laughs> and I mean, just, just to give you, there's a point later in the movie where he's basically saying, hey, do you know who died for your sins? There's a guy who named, who died for your sins. Do you know who it is? And I was like, oh, tip of my tongue starts with a J. <laughs> so, so he's got these people asking, he's asking them which came first, a chicken or an egg. And I guess this is just another way of wording the infinite regress problem that, you know, what, you would have had a chicken to inseminate the egg. So therefore, the chicken must have been created fully formed. Not that the egg could predate chickens by millions and millions of years, and the chicken could be a direct descendant of Tyrannosaurus's. So it was actually a Tyrannosaurus inseminating an ever more chicken like Tyrannosaurus or whatever. You know, we don't go there with it. What we go, what we get instead is these these hillbillies going like, well, now I reckon that's because the chicken would have had to come out of an egg. And the egg would have had to come out of chicken. Dude, you just blew my mind right there now. <laughs> yeah, that question is not meant to convince someone of God or science theory. That question is meant to convince someone to pass, right? You're like, yeah, no, wait, I got one for you. Which came first? One second. <laughs> the chicken or the egg and everyone else in your middle school is like well but the fact that ray and also that's googleable like that's a, i wanted so badly throughout this movie for some teenager just be like one second <laughs> egg bro how come you didn't find it also how come you're so sweaty you know, a novel idea would be to actually ask an expert in the field, an evolutionary biologist, which is what I did. Jerry Coyne, author of Why Evolution is True, joined me on Skype for just a few minutes to talk about the chicken and the egg. Jerry, you just got back from Hong Kong. What's the story? What are you doing over there? I was giving talks on evolution and science versus religion. Uh the uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, and the people were surprisingly receptive to it, at least in Hong Kong or and the mainland China. Singapore, where there's a, a bigger incursion of religion into the country, uh, I got a little bit of pushback on the religion thing, but nothing I couldn't handle. So, well, you know, we're getting a lot of religion here in the United States. We're reviewing Ray Comfort's film. I wanted a rendezvous here on Skype with you to talk mm -hmm. about a couple of arguments. The first is he takes these people on the street and he asks them this profound question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And of course, they're like, well, they get caught in that feedback loop, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, well, how refreshing would it be not to just grab some poor schmo on the street, but to speak to an expert expert about this kind of thing? What's the story on the chicken and the egg, Jerry? Well, you know, this is as far as I know from Ray's Comfort's new film. He did another film, you know, before that, where he had a supposedly grabber question for people about historical versus observational science. But I presume we've already gone over that. This one is just supposed to be a conundrum of people. And no matter whether they answer the chicken or the egg, he's going to say the same thing. Well, you can't have a chicken without an egg and you can't have an egg without a chicken. So, you know, how could they, you know, work together? Well, first of all, you know, the egg. There is a clear answer scientifically to this question, which is that the egg came first because chickens evolved from reptiles and reptiles had always evolved the egg. So, you know, Comfort should have asked the question, you know, well, which came first, the fish or the egg? Because that's where eggs first <laughs> developed, maybe even earlier than that, or which came first, the amphibian and the egg. But he doesn't have the savvy to do that. So, um, so there's two levels of the question. The first one I just answered. The egg came first, without a doubt. Second of all, okay, well, how does a, an animal and its reproductive system evolve, you know, in tandem with one another? How do you get a chick, how do you get an amphibian producing a frog egg at the same time? Well, that's not a problem. I mean, there's antecedents that go way back to the origin of, you know, eggs and sperm and, you know, mammals, sorry, not mammals, but animals that evolved, you know, 500 million years ago. Um, 
and that pro and we have a very good evolutionary theory about how this dimorphism of gametes because the egg is basically a gamete until it's fertilized them how that evolved so you know naturally the average person is not going to have the sophistication to answer a question like that so you know comfort's tactic is to say aha you know, you can't answer it. evolution is stupid. <laughs> and he segues out of that into, well, what good is a chicken heart if you don't have blood vessels and blood to go in the vessels? What good are the vessels without the blood or the heart? And he does this scenario. Essentially, he's speaking about all the pieces of the puzzle of, as if they must all of a sudden appear. They just manifest or are created uh, or evolved instantly. That's kind of his shtick, you know? Yeah, this is the God of the gaps argument. It's also the irreducible complexity argument that the ID people are fond of. And, you know, Darwin answered that for a, a very complex organ in the eye and the origin. You know, how do you get the a camera eye with the lens and the retina and the optic nerve and stuff? Um, they all have to be present in order for the eye to work. And so it couldn't possibly evolve. But, of course, the answer to that, which Darwin gave, is you start with a light-sensitive eye spot. Um, and then you gradually improve that over time. And you can show through simulations that each improvement gives a reproductive advantage to the thing. So, you know, eventually you get to this complex feature, which the average person is not going to be able to say, well, I can't answer, you know, they're not going to be able to say, well, it evolved in a stepwise fashion from a pigmented eye spot and a very early flatworm or something like that. But, you know, that's not a problem. So this is the God of the gaps argument. If you can't answer my question, then God must exist. Now, in terms of the heart, um, we have primitive hearts that are just the equivalent of the primitive eye spot, the you know the light sensitive pigment spot, which you can see in a planaria. And those are things in like selenerates and tunicates. I'm not sure exactly which invertebrates have them, but they're just and also arthropods like my fruit flies. And they they're just pumps that squeeze, but there's no vessels. Okay, it squeezes the hemolymph you know, the body fluids in the body cavity by itself. And so there's no vessel. So what you have is a primitive pulsating thing that simply circulates the nutrients and the oxygen around through the body. And you can see that's an advantage, right? And then maybe it would be advantageous to maybe channel some of that pumping stuff to certain parts of the body. And so you'd get an advantage for the development of vessels. And then same with the eye, you know, a step-by-step -step thing. But starting with one feature, like a light-sensitive eye spot or a pulsating um, part of the body that is advantageous in itself. So, you know, this is not a problem for evolutionary biologists. He didn't get into any of this. Um, yeah, of course not. You know, he doesn't want to. I mean, I cannot help but think that the man is duplicitous because if you do the merest investigation of this kind of stuff, you're going to find the answer. <laughs> yeah. So he's probably, you know, doing what they call lying for Jesus. I don't know. But any competent biologist or evolutionist would be able to Tell Ray, comfort, you know, you're full of it. <laughs> hey, Jerry, is it true that we can see examples of all of the sort of gradient steps of the eye and of the heart currently in nature? I mean, you can see the the yeah. small yeah. organisms with the light spots, and you can see the the not quite complex eye, the basic eye, and then the more complex stages. Right now, we can see the evolution of the eye. Well, yeah, but we, well, what you're not seeing is evolution. You're seeing a cross-section of stages which mimic what really happened in the lineage that produced the eye and showing that each one of those stages is adaptive to the organism. So we have a planarium with a light sensitive eye spot. It's adaptive. Then we have examples and, and Richard Dawkins gives these in the book, The Blind Watchmaker. So he actually, I think that's the book, has a page with living examples of every sequence. So, you know, this is Darwin's answer and it's very smart. We can't have seen the eye evolve from a light sensitive pigment spot to a camera eye, but if we can show that each step of that process is instantiated in nature and it's adaptive, then there's no problem in saying, well, the transition from each step to the next step is also adaptive because it improves your ability to find light and to make an image and to avoid predators, find prey, get food and so on. And we can see that with the heart as well. I mean, you can see very primitive hearts, like in my fruit flies, where it's just basically a pulsating tube that circulates the body fluid. There's no vessels in a fruit fly. So, you know, there you go. And then, you know, I'm not, I haven't surveyed the animal kingdom to look at all the stages, but I'm absolutely certain that we would be able to find, you know, many, many supposedly intermediate stages of this transition as final stages in organisms living right now. So, you know, Ray Comfort is just as bad in this video. You know, it was last one where he stopped people in the street and said, well, if you can't see evolution happening now, it didn't happen because there's a difference between historical science and observational science. And it's only the latter that really counts. If you can't see evolution happening, regardless of the fossils, regardless of the embryos, regardless of the vestigial organs, 
you can't, it didn't happen. I mean, that's just as scientifically fallacious an argument as the one you're telling me he's making now. Comfort trades on the fact that the average person doesn't know much about evolution. And so when they're faced with a complex question, they throw their hands up. And to comfort, that's a victory. But to science, it's, it's, a, it's only a victory for the lack of education of these people. That is, we're not doing a good enough job. But, but the average person shouldn't really have to know all this stuff. I mean, you can't expect somebody that, you know, has another job to know all these details about evolution. That's and probably so, a fair thing to say. You know, I don't know the answer. Let's go find out. We can yeah. now go and use this as a springboard and let's go get the data. Many people yeah. feel on the spot like they have to have the answer or they look ignorant or misled or, or stupid, you know? Yeah. I mean, that that's a very good thing you said because that's the correct answer. We scientists are used to saying, I don't know. You know, and we don't, and that's not an admission of, that God did anything. It's an admission that we don't know. But Ray Comfort has traded on this idea that if scientists cannot answer something, or even in this case, if the average person can't answer something, then it must mean that God did it. You know, well, I asked Ray Comfort, you know, first of all, that argument has been dispelled so many times epilepsy, lightning, smallpox, all these things were once imputed to God. And you could ask the average person, well, why is this guy having fits? And if you don't know the answer, well, you know, is that God? No, we found out it's electrical impulses in the brain. And so the whole history of science is the replacement of supernatural explanations with natural ones. So to say that, you know, I don't know is an admission of God's existence is a deeply fallacious thing to do. The problem is that the average person doesn't want to say, I don't know. Or if they do, Ray Comfort's going to say, see, aha, you can't answer that question. So ergo God. <laughs> Another explanation would be, well, you know, how come... How do you know, Ray, that it wasn't Wotan or, or you know, Allah or um, any of the numerous gods in history that do it? Why does this vindicate your particular Christian religion if these people can't answer a question? So, you know, it's a theological mess. It's all explainable in the evolutionary model. This is not, it's not even a small mystery. It's... Well, and can we reflect on the fact that primarily Comfort was finding his people at college campuses? every one of which has a biology department. <laughs> he had to overlook that. He had to go past that to find the guy's hacky sacking. Yeah, like within a thousand feet, there were like several people that could have answered these questions well in every case, no? And, and he's basically saying like, right, like everything's finished, so uh, nothing's yes. partially evolved. Is, is that what part? I mean, like I have two partially evolved legs on either side of my body. I don't understand what he's trying to even get at. <laughs> He did the half an eye argument, you know, how did the eye yeah. evolve? Yep. Why is it, uh, of course, I'm thinking to myself, the eye is, it's amazing, but it's not a, certainly far from a perfect construction. These are old arguments. When he kept showing the montage is the stock video of all the animals, two by two, male and female, these little Aussie and Harriet <laughs> animal families that he had found on my stock photo. I thought, when's the montage of the animals that exhibit non-heterosexual behavior in the wild? Because they do so by the hundreds. And oh, there wasn't I, one of those naturally occurring relationships displayed on screen. Yeah. Huh. Would have loved or to see a couple of, like a seahorse fucking itself and just cut, cut, cut. Or, or where is the section where he's like, man, if there wasn't a god, how could there be a parasite that burrows into your eye and burrows its way back what? into your brain <laughs> as you scream yourself to death, huh? What but a yeah, good and loving god could create effect. that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I love – because the, there is a lot of moments in this movie that are just like this little ephemeral touch of homophobia. He's like, and look at all the animals, and they're all heterosexual. Or this little touch of Islamophobia. is like, no, our religion is based on love. It's not like some religions. you know. And then he just will cut to the other – you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. We don't have to dwell on that. We, we, we give, <laughs> it's a code we've got, you and I. Interview we at the 23-minute mark in The Atheist Delusion. Declares that he thinks God is an energy – <laughs> Ray says, <laughs> Ray says, like an energy drink? And the guy oh, says, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right. they deserve each other. Those people can talk back and forth for the next several hundred years. The man cannot discern the difference between a powerful space wizard and a can of full throttle. I don't understand it. God gives you wings. It's true. That's how it works. <laughs> 
Well, I also love, too, that, you know, because Ray has this sort of wink and a nod, oh, like an energy drink? That would be silly. Now, let me tell you about my magic carpenter friend, you know? <laughs> like, like the fact that you can describe it in such a way as to make it sound silly is not an argument against. Everything you say sounds silly, Ray. Ray Comfort talks a lot about hell in The Atheist Delusion, and he talks about hell in almost an affectionate way. Like, don't you want to live in a just world where people roast together, scream and burn and flare forever and ever? And ever? I mean, because he, he frames hell with justice in mind. Didn't he use um, a very macabre example? What if someone like raped your mom or something? Do you guys remember yeah, that section? That's his opening question. His opening question is like, do you believe in hell? And it's a montage of people saying no. And then he goes, but what if someone raped your mother? And they're like, I'm listening. I'm listening. It's terrifying. Wouldn't Start you want justice? Open. Wouldn't you want someone to pay for that crime? Wouldn't the just thing to be payment? And there's no conversation at all about the proportionality of eternal torment at all. Ray's totally comfortable with the burning of men, women, and children alive without end. Well, and not only that, but he's trying to solve the problem of evil by saying, no, but my guy's even more evil. Because, like, I mean, the question of, like, what if your mom was raped and murdered? And I would, I would say, well, that would sure be evidence that there wasn't a loving God looking after her, wouldn't there? But instead, that's like, that would totally justify sending people to hell for touching their winkies, now wouldn't it? And isn't this also a section where he brings up Hitler to, yes. to <laughs> address the problem of evil on... Uh, you, uh, really? <laughs> no, I'll give him credit. It took him almost a half an hour to say the name <laughs> Hitler. But we all knew it was coming. We He's got a was. Hitler jar like most people have a swear jar. Like it goes back to like, sorry, sorry, pizza patty on Ray. Very <laughs> uncomfortable moment as he looks at one of his interviewees. This is probably around the half hour mark. And he says, the reason you're an atheist is because you love your porn. And you can tell the guy's going through the Rolodex of potential responses to the question. <laughs> yeah, so? Uh, do I admit it? Do I, am I proud of it? How much do I tell him? You know, he just, and so I, in fact, pornography came up quite a bit. Fornication, pornogra pornography. You just want to, you want to go in and commit sinful, lustful acts without any accountability. That's the reason that you really don't acknowledge my God. Mm -hmm. And what's so amazing is there's this incredible, like, I love the tiny moments in Ray's where Ray, like, accidentally captures humanity. And there's this great moment. This guy goes, I don't watch porn. And Ray's like, really? And he's like, I have a girlfriend now, which is why I don't watch porn. And he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> before you had a girlfriend. And he's like, oh, yeah, I watched a ton of porn before I had a girlfriend. <laughs> you might see this. Before... <laughs> My favorite moment in the entire movie is the is the overweight kid that he asks. He's, he's like, because he's doing he he falls into his, you know, are you a good person thing that he does in all of his movies, where he then convinces you that you're a bad person because you stole a a, a song on uh, Napster years ago and you said O M G only the real words, and he says to this to, to this uh, one kid, he's like, have you ever watched porn? And the kid goes. Uh, <laughs> No, no. He says, have you ever lied? And the kid's like, yeah, just now about the porn. <laughs> Did you know that things are so well designed in nature that human beings are actually grabbing God's design in nature to make artificial stuff? For example, tunnel digging machines. And uh, they had these surfers who built a wave machine. Therefore, God. Well, see, I didn't know those things because I didn't buy the lovely color photograph book that you can get in this movie for <laughs> Don't Answer Yet. Just, yeah, and, and his <laughs> argument seems to be, look, God is so great that science has to go to nature to come up with ideas for things that are way better than the stuff an omnipotent God could make. <laughs> I, at this moment in the film, am, I would beg for the opportunity to have been one of the interviewees because I have some questions about design. And I just made a little list here. And just off the top of my head, right? Hey, Ray, how about a son that gives us cancer? I'm just curious about that. You know, human embryonic tails, animals that have wings but cannot fly, fish that have eyes but cannot see, wisdom teeth, nipples on men. Tell me what that's about. A spinal cord that doesn't regenerate, limbs that don't regenerate. How about the giraffe that's got that laryngeal nerve that has to travel 15 extra feet instead of going right to the destination, which is, I think, less than 12 inches. Ocean-dwelling animals that have to surface just so they can breathe to survive. Flying animals 
animals that have heavy bones, redundant DNA and RNA? How about the blood vessels in my eye that cause a blind spot? So essentially, I have to hallucinate so I can see a full field of vision. How about 99% of the animals on this planet going extinct? How's that for design? I wonder what Ray, <laughs> you know what, Eli, in Ray's voice, how would Ray respond to those? Well, Seth, I'm glad you asked me about the function of a male nipple. <laughs> and uh, if I'll just lower my webcam now, <laughs> to show you. now, I need you to describe a banana very, very slowly to me. <laughs> very, very slowly. You like your pawn, don't you, Seth? You like your pawn. Yeah, you like your pawn. You're a naughty, naughty sinner. Then I assume you would walk away, Seth. I assume you would. I would have walked away a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, hey, Ray, if I'm so perfectly appointed and, and designed and created for this moment by God, why the 250 million other sperm? I'm just curious. <laughs> it's like backup dances. It's like backup dances. Right? You're there for Beyonce, but the other sperm are backup dances. Probably for me, and you guys sound off as much as you want on this. I am sick and tired in this film and in Ray's ministry of him telling me what I believe or what I don't believe, what I think, right? Here's what an atheist believes, or here's an atheist worldview. Whoa, wait a minute. I didn't realize atheism was a worldview. And then Ray, and this is part of what made Matt Dillahunty so crazy during their exchange on the radio, is that he kept telling Matt, well, no, here's what you think. Here's what you thought. Here's what you did. Here's what your perception was. Here's whether or not you were real or genuinely believed. He likes to tell atheists what atheists are and aren't. Yeah, and that's the, this whole movie. I mean, you, you think about it, like you've seen movies with a with a big chunk of like man on the street interviews, but generally in those movies, the man on the street gets to talk, right? What, what, what we get from these guys largely is yes, no answers, and then them sitting there and sort of nodding along while Ray talks off camera. He's even using that like you know, the fast inhalation you use when you're afraid somebody's going to cut you off. So you just keep talking and you never have to. It's the inward singing of having a conversation <laughs> with somebody. He's doing that throughout. So, like, clearly he's saying, you know, well, you're an atheist and you believe this. Well, no, I don't yet. You believe that. that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list off a bunch of animals before you can answer me now. <laughs> we call that the uh, the speak and spell defense, by the way. Like, at least seven different times in this movie, he goes off on a childlike rant where he says, and the giraffes and the birds and the platypuses and the fleas and the dogs and the cats and the rhinos and the hippos and the eel hippos. It, just, yeah, just get and ready for hard, that. I You're think gonna... what's really hard to digest is that the camera, did they shoot a two camera because they only seem to be using one with the man on the street. So while Ray is providing the lion's share of the dialogue, <laughs> we are locked on to the sort of still glazed over face of the interviewee and Ray remains off camera. That changes, I think, at about halfway through the film. They finally cut away and you see Ray himself. But until then, you're hearing his voice, but you're looking right into the faces and the eyes of these interviewees. And it it's actually a little jarring. It's a, it, it's a disconnect, I think, for the viewer. Well, and it also makes you wonder, was he just going like, so you like ketchup on your fries? Yeah, ketchup. yeah. Keep nodding, keep nodding. You like ketchup? Yeah. You like you? Yeah. How about mustard? You like mustard? Like on a on a hot yeah. dog? Yeah, yeah, that makes and sense. And then just dubbing in his nonsense <laughs> about uh, DNA and whatnot afterwards. I mean, does Ray have a history? I, I know there are some people who have done very unfair edits. Hell, I know people who've come on atheist shows secretly recorded the conversation on their side unfairly edited it, and then sold that conversation to religious audiences on the internet. I don't know what Ray's story is. Does he have a history of sort of massaging the edits? He must have been here. I mean, they were ridiculous. It was like, all right, now say counseling for Jose Ray is super smart. <laughs> pause, pause after Jose. Pause. Do it one more time. Pause after Jose. Okay, got it. It's Here's so much of that. Here's the thing. If he doesn't massage his edits, and maybe he doesn't, maybe we look at the uncut footage of these movies, which we'll never get access to, but maybe we do. And that old guy is just standing there and Ray's like, yeah, yeah. So we're going to start shooting the old guy's like, I'm going to kill myself. And Ray's like, oh, <laughs> why? And he's like, I want to. Well, that seems, that smacks of the unfair. I mean, call me a film critic, but I don't think that guy was just sitting there and he was like, uh, all right, three, two, one, I'd like to kill myself. All right. <laughs> Off I go. <laughs>
I do not think that guy is depressed because we just watched Expelled, the Ben Stein movie, and Ben Stein did a very similar thing, and I think here's what happened. I think Ray was like, what if you get cancer? What if a big old tumor grows out of your brain and starts to push against the back of your eyeballs so that they're going to fall out of your head? What would you like then? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'd probably want to die with dignity. And he's like, ah, so you'd kill yourself? And he's like, yeah, I'd kill myself. I'd want to die with dignity. And he's like, got it. Yeah, I'd kill myself. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I kind of feel like th if if any one person in this movie of his man on the streets is just like a human I'm not buying, it's this guy. And maybe I'm wrong, but at one point in this movie, now this guy is, starts off as an atheist, but eventually sees the error of his ways and goes all Jesus because of the brilliance that Ray has thrown upon him. But at one point when Ray is asking this guy like, well, do you think this book could have just fallen out of the sky and come from nothing? He goes, no, that would be as unlikely as a tornado whipping through a junkyard and putting together a 747. <laughs> the atheist on the street used that specific example by chance. So I'm not saying I know he's a plant, but if anyone in this movie is a plant, it's that gentleman. So the angel song begins, the soundtrack changes. We start to see everybody get a little weepy as he goes for the big score at the end, right? He's going for the conversion. <laughs> Well, now I, I want to ask you on a sort of a related topic, uh, Seth, because I know that you did a lot of video editing and still do, and you did a lot of contract work with this stuff. How often when you're doing video editing, does the client insist that you have a montage within the film of people agreeing with him when he says he makes sense? Never. Because I've seen <laughs> this is now three Ray Comfort movies I have seen that include a montage of him going, now all that stuff that I just said kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And everybody's like, yeah, it makes, no, you're, no, you did really good. You did great. <laughs> what about Jose Reyes? Final thoughts on The Atheist Illusion, the film that we watched so that our viewers and listeners didn't have to. Tell me your final thoughts on it. I'm convinced this atheism is crap. You guys just don't. I mean, where? what is the other turtle resting on? I don't get it. So he, he, he cured me. He cured me. Way to go, Ray. Heath Enright, any final thoughts? Uh, I choose porn still. <laughs> no, sticking with it faithfully. E Eli Bosnick, what do you think? Ray teaches us a really valuable lesson, which is that you can prove anything to be true if you refuse to give a teenager their frisbee back until they admit it. And I think that's really what we learned today. Check out my new The A Spider Man is Delusion, where I can. <laughs> kids on college campuses that spider-man is real <laughs> i will include a link once again to god awful movies are you guys a weekly podcast are you bi-weekly what yeah we're weekly. every week every uh tuesday at 7 a.m eastern and give me some of the highlights of recent films on the roster that people can hear besides the atheist illusion We've got I'm Not Afraid, the movie about the girl who died in Columbine, uh, which is a fantastic journey into one teenage girl died. It is 99% how hard it is to be white and Christian and a teenager. And then at the end, like a twist ending, she gets shot and everyone's like, so Jesus. So we've got that <laughs> one. <laughs> we also recently did Expelled, the uh, Ben Stein documentary, we're going to say. Uh, we did that as a live show over in England uh, where we were uh, asked to show people how stupid America was. And uh, we said, wait till you see our election. Uh, but we'll do this movie between now and then. I will include a link to God Awful Movies again in the description box. Thanks for helping me flesh this out and uh, sort of make what was a really pretty tedious film entertaining to explore. And and uh, we'll include a link to all that stuff. Thanks, you guys, for what you do. Thanks for being so fun and entertaining and, and getting the word out, and we'll catch you later, okay? Thanks for having Thanks us, Fred. Thanks for having us, Steph.